for life. Ul, Musiba. I'll talk. I'm a little nervous. You know, once I feel live, that's true. All right. Okay, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Oh, sorry. Wunashinta is that the name of the Father, Son, sorry. Um, well, thank you guys for having me back a uh, third day in a row. Uh, some of you are sick of me, I'm sure. Um, no, thank you. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to continue my, my, my hope not to get invited back. But anyway, so um, today I'll talk about the Monday through Saturday Christian. It's a talk I gave at... Uh, in New York for a, a youth conference retreat, and I think it's an important talk um, that we have to think about as servants and as Christians in general. Um, and and it just kind of keeps coming back to this verse that uh, that I that I love for by Saint Paul. He says, "You know, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me." Um, and what does that mean? It's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. And and this is kind of the the ultimate objective of Christianity. Right, that people see us and they don't see us. They see him uh, and not us. So that there's, uh, as it says in Galatians, right, there's just less of us and, and more of him. And so the idea, of, you know, I want to talk about is kind of this, what does orthodoxy in action look like? Um, what does living an orthodox Christian outside of the church mean? Um, and I'll, I'll start with a, a poem um, that I, I read a long time ago that I really liked. Um, it's called Fencing Christ In. The cross having failed, the world turned to a far more subtle way of disposing of Jesus. It worshipped him. It put him, and I love that first sentence, when the cross failed to dispose of Jesus, the world turned to a different way to dispose of Jesus. It worshipped Jesus. It put him high up on a high, it put him on a high altar with its ornate and costly symbols and fenced him in there. It said to him, stay there. That is where you belong. Stay there, and when Sunday comes, we shall worship you. And all the while, Jesus keeps pleading, don't fence me in. Let me down from your crosses. Let me down from your altars. Let me out of the four walls of your churches. Let me into your minds and hearts. Let me into your home. Let me into your offices and your marts of trade. Let me into your communities and the, in your count, and your, and the councils of your statesmen. I want to get back where I first started, walking in the common ways of men and talking with them about how to live and how to live together. I love that. And so sometimes um, the issue that we start to have is the church is the place where God is, right? And what we do is we kind of think of ourselves as... Um, you know, this is the place where we, if you will, shine as Christians, right? And we become the light of the church. And Christ told us to become the light of the world, not the light of the church. And unfortunately, church becomes its own little ecosystem, its own little, you know, the, the place where we know where our place is, where we thrive. We know where our service is. We know where things go. We, we have a role to play. We have duties here. And this becomes... I saw the coffee and thought, I have a coffee. I have a caramel macchiato. Um, um, and so the, 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 this, the, this church becomes this place where I shine. And unfortunately, um, you know, just to be, to be blunt, right, being an immigrant church didn't help that situation, right? Because what we ended up having is there's a lot of people who came, you know, this is a foreign country, it's a foreign language, it's a foreign culture, and you know, I want church to be a little slice of home, right? In fact, I want it to be very Egyptian. I want it to be Ar very Arabic. I, I want to speak in Arabic. I want to tell Arabic jokes. I want to eat Arabic food. I miss home. And so church became a little embassy, if you will, of home, which I totally understand. This is what my parents did, and, um, and I get that, right? But then as we started, um, you know, moving too far into that, into that realm, right, then, then church could be a cultural place, Right, not a Christian place, and it's there to preserve the culture and the traditions. And no, it's a place for me to find Christ, um, and I need to do that in a way that's culturally appropriate. Right? But once the, the church sort of becomes this um, the center of my life, and not God, 
not Christ, then we have an issue, right? And then especially when it's really the center of my life and really the center of my worship on Sunday, you know, from 8 to 12, right? And then the rest of the time, it's just kind of like whatever. Um, so th this, this is sort of the thing I want to talk about today. And what does it mean to be a Monday to Saturday Christian? I'll even extend that further, you know, a Sunday afternoon to uh, Saturday Christian, right? Um, so the first thing is we, and I'm going to talk about each of these in turn, is, is a place where we absorb Christ and then become light for those in the world. It's a time to give everyone you see the same love and forgiveness you just received. Right? And, and so what does it mean to be light? And sometimes we think light means I tell people verses at work. And I tell them I'm a Christian. And I you know, proclaim to them the, the goodness of my life and the badness of their life. Right? And that's not what Christ did at all. Right? Um, in fact, so when I come here and I receive love, then it only makes sense that I go out and for the next six days I give love. And I came here and I received mercy and forgiveness, and I should go out and give mercy and forgiveness for the next six days, right? So this is a place where I take, right? It's not a place for me to be. It's just a place to drink, to absorb, to grow. And then I go and I disperse that everywhere. The liturgy starts when we leave church. I love this phrase. In fact, in the Catholic Church, um, they call the liturgy, they have a word for it, they call it the Mass. Right? And does anyone know where this comes from by any chance? For the longest time, I, I, I knew where it came from, but I didn't understand how beautiful it was. It, means, it comes from the word itamisa, which means go, this is the dismissal. So why do they call it that? Why do you call it the dismissal? That's kind of a weird thing to call the, the liturgy. Well, it turns out because that's the primary purpose of the liturgy. This is the place you go from. Church isn't the place you go to. It's the place you go from. And from there, you go and you become light, right? So now, we call this place the place you go from. Now, go be. Go be elsewhere, you know? And a lot of people, you know, they'll come up to me and goes, you know, I, I want to get back in a church. I haven't been in a long time. You know, we're at a, one of those American churches in, in, in L.A. And so some people haven't been to church in 10, 15, 20 years, you know, come back to that church. And they're like, I want to get back into it. And I want to start doing things. And I want to start serving. And I want to start. I'm like, you know, hang on. Why don't you just start being? <laughs> Why don't you just start being a Christian? You don't have to actually do anything. Well, how about like start with your wife, your husband, your kids, your boss, your family. Be that light and just start being and living instead of doing. Right? And so we do a lot of doing. And, you know, ever, often I think about, you know, Mary and Martha. And, you know, we're all really good at being Martha, you know. And, and you know, we had this talk come up at the, at, the, at the retreat was, you know, people get burned out being Martha, you know, and, and then Martha got burnt out and she complained to Jesus just like the servants complained to Jesus. You know, I'm running around and that girl over there just sitting there not doing anything. Say, like Damien, come on in, Habibi. Nice bandana. <laughs> not bandana, headband. So blue. Amorenta, <sighs> Damien. This is being live streamed, by the way, so that's Damien. <laughs> Everyone loves Damien. It's his smile. He's so cute. Come on in. Nice legs. <laughs> oh, you know, just making people uncomfortable is my love language. So it's just it's how I express... And I'm supposed to be a good person, I know. All right, so then, um, and so the, the last kind of point I want to talk about is this idea of you've just come in and drank from the fountain of life. That's what the Eucharist is. That's the liturgy. And then like we talked about in the retreat, the liturgy isn't important. It's everything, right? It's, it's what makes us a church. It's what makes us the body of Christ. It's how we are fed, right? So it is life. And, and, the, and the words that Jesus used in, at the end of John chapter 6 are just kind of, the, you know, he made no bones about it, right? He, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him, and you have no life in you, and I will resurrect him on the last day. I mean, it's just unequivocal. And even to the point where when the disciples are like, you know, some of the, it says some of the disciples left Jesus after he said all those things, and he turned to the 12 and said, do you want to leave as well? Like, uh, th these words are going nowhere, right? So that's how important the Eucharist is, right? But what 
what uh, squashes, what quenches the, the fire of the Eucharist is when we keep it here in this building, right? And we're just really prayerful and really hot here. And we're like, all right, I got my church on, right? I, I did my duty. I got my couple hours in. I'm good to go, right? And what about the rest of the week? You know, what about every person you encounter, right? So this idea of the dismissal, right? The liturgy starts when we leave. So this, this first one, absorb Christ and then become light for those in the world. So St. Peter says, as his divine power has given to us all, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. And I, there's this book I read that I really loved called Partakers of Divine Nature, right? And of course, this is an EO book, so they use words like um, theosis, which we don't use in the Coptic church, or some people do, but some people don't like. It doesn't really matter. Um, we're just going to say Partakers of Divine Nature, since that's what St. Peter says. Um, and what this book really talks about is how we just become a part of him, right? And that's ultimately the objective of, of the Christian life is to fully walk in the image and likeness of, of him, right? And so, you know, and, and we see this um, when, when we have a baby, right? When you have a baby, you know, you're all parents, you're all really excited, right? He has, you know, this one has my fingers, this one has my nose, this one has my ear, this one has my eyes, right? And everyone's really excited that the baby is in their image, Right? But then as you raise the baby, and we talked a little bit about this yesterday, right? I, I turn it into my likeness. Right? And, you know, I say, you know, that's bad, that's good, that's bad, that's good. And what I'm really doing is saying, I want you to be like me. Right? And it gives us great happiness when we see our kids like me. I remember just like a few months ago, my son, who's 22, someone said something. I don't remember what they said. And I had this thought, I had my, what I was going to respond with, like, like, well, you know, and I was going to say something. And then my son said, well, and he said exactly what I was going to say, right? And I thought, dang, my kid's awesome, right? <laughs> and the reason I thought that is because he's awesome because he's like me, right? Which is very egotistical. But this is ultimately what, what God wants of us, right? He wants us to be to say what he says, to think what he thinks, to love the way he loved, right? And I don't know how he does that. Okay, I'll send you Jesus. You can watch him for three and a half years and you can see what that means and how that looks and how that manifests itself. You know, it will, I will take flesh and show you what I am and who I am, right? And of course, the best part of this book and why I highly recommend that you should read it is the, is the author's name, Christophorus Stavropoulos, which say that four times. I mean, once I saw that, I was like, yeah, I'm in. I got to read this book. <laughs> okay, so th the next thing we're going to talk about is sort of this absorbing the characteristics of God. So as we enter into the life with God, we become like him, right? We talk like him, we think like him, we act like him, um, we understand like him, and we start to have compassion like him, you know? And we, we, we and ultimately, hopefully, this feeds into we love like him. Right? And so we start to see things the way Christ would see them. You know, when someone comes up to us and says, I can't believe she said this, this, and this. You know, in the beginning, you know, maybe when you're a teenager, you go, like, yeah, you know, let's, let's cancel her. And, you know, let's, let's mess her with her life. And, and now you get a little older and you've loved God and God's loved you a little bit more. And now you're like, you know, maybe she's hurting. Maybe she needs a friend. Maybe that's why she's lashing out. Right? So now I start to see this person the way God must see them. Right? And it's a good exercise to get into, to see somebody the way God must see them. And that's what happens as we start to live with someone, right? We start to, you know, like my son did, say the same thing I would say, right? And, you know, we've all done this, right, with our parents. We start to say the same things that they say and do the same things they do, right? Because we've lived with them, right? And, and when I say live with them, I don't mean like, oh, I have to stand there for a really long time in a building. I mean, I want to read his words, because they're his words, and I want to know what my dad thinks, and I want to know how my dad reacted to certain situations, and I want to know what my dad says. Not I should read one chapter of the Bible because that's a blessing in my life, and I really should. No, no, no. This is your dad, and this is who he is, and you want to know who he is, right? And I, you know, I really should pray every, you know, every night for 10 minutes at least because, you know, I really should do that. No, that's your dad, and you're dying for a chance to talk with him and commune with him. And this is, by the way, where the understanding of theology becomes useful, right? Because every once in a while, is that you, Damien? No. Seriously? Um, I was like, you know, there must be someone out there, a child, Hadim should be a femme. Listen, no, it's Damien. Um, 
What was I saying? So this is why the understanding of theology, you should sit there because you're just like good for me. Um, <laughs> hate is my love language. You know, it's just another one of them. <laughs> so this is, this is why we learn theology, right? You know, we don't learn theology because, you know, I want to learn a bunch of books and I want to read a bunch of books and I want to learn Greek and, you know, say a really, ponti you know, pontificate and tell you all about things I really don't understand but I know Greek words for, right? We understand theology because that's who my dad is and I want to understand him, right? And the more I know about my dad, the more I can become like my dad, right? And that's, that's why we learn. And sometimes once theology becomes an end in of itself, right? And, and something I'm learning maybe for my pride, my ego, maybe I want to give a really good talk and I want people to be wowed by all the Greek words I know. And I say, oh, you know, in the Greek, there's six words for this particular. Then it's an educational um, academic exercise and not theology, right? And the fathers of the church teach us, right? The true theologian is what? The man who stands in praise, right? That's just an old adage. Um, and that's so true. Okay. I said all those things. So we want to enter into this depth of the life with God. And what depth is not is, and this is very important, is blind imitation. So I'm going to read you this, um, uh, the story that St. Hilarion told, um, and Abu Dhabi Kamil, uh, the saint from sporting, he used to tell this story all the time. He loved this story. And so if he loved it, I loved it. Um, he says, I don't know, should I read it to you? It's kind of long. Okay. I could just tell it to you, like with sock puppets and stuff, but we can do the reading. All right. I'll, I'll enter. Okay. I don't know. All right. Consider the hunting dogs which chase after hares, right? So a hare is like a big rabbit, right? So, you know, back in England and stuff, they'd say, you know, release the hounds, right? And then the hounds would chase after the hare, and then they'd, these hunting dogs would go, and then the guy with the gun would walk behind them, and then he'd shoot the hare, and he'd think he's a, you know, big macho guy, right? That's what we do in Texas, at least, right? So imagine one of these dogs, one dog, sees a rabbit in the distance and immediately gives chase. The other dogs that are with him see this dog taking off and take off after him, right? So you can see it. The dog takes off. All the dogs take off, even though they have not seen the hare. So they know this dog must have seen something. They haven't seen the hare themselves, but they know this guy took off. I'm going to take off, right? They will continue running with him, but only for a time. When at length the effort and struggle exhaust them, they will give up the chase and turn back. So the dogs that didn't see the hare, didn't see the rabbit, they start to give up after a while. However, the dog that saw the rabbit continues chasing it by himself. He does not allow the effort or the struggle to hinder him from completing his long course. He risks his life as he goes on, giving himself no rest. He does not allow the turning aside of the other dogs behind him to put him off. So he doesn't even care that all the other dogs have stopped chasing. It's like, I see the rabbit. I'm going for it. He goes on running until he has caught the rabbit he saw. He is careless both of the stumbling blocks in his path, whether stones or thrones, thorns, and of the wounds that have inflicted him. So also, the brother who wishes to follow after the love of Christ must fix his gaze upon the cross until he catches up with him that was crucified upon it, even though he sees everyone else has begun to turn back. And Abu Nusho Kamen, when he used to talk about this story, he'd say, look, if you chase the you know, the butt of the dog in front of you, right? You're going to give up after a while, right? And we do a lot of this, right? We don't actually see the rabbit. We just chase everyone. We see everyone else kind of doing this thing, so we kind of do this thing, right? And eventually, we all get sick of doing this thing, right? And the only way we stick and, and, and make it to the end is if we, we actually focus on Christ. And if it's just focus on, you know, I really want to preserve the rituals and tradition of the church, that fades, I really want to be a part of the group. That fades. I really want to be, uh, you know, um, known at church. That fades, you know, for some of our, our young boys. I really want to get the microphone someday and be the leader of the hymns. That fades. All that stuff fades, right, after a while, right? And the only thing that sticks is the person who's actually seen Christ and is focused on him, right? So that ultimately has to be our goal as servants, right? It isn't I want to serve the kids and I want to do this thing and I want to. It's I'm fixated on Christ right? And everything I do is about him, right? And as we talked about last time, right? You know, I don't have a boss. I don't have a, you know, I'm not working for the Amin al-Khidma. I'm not working for Abuna. I'm not working for the bishop. I'm not working for the Pope. I work for Christ. I serve God, 
right? I don't want to serve the kids. I don't serve the parents. I serve him only in everything I do. Clean the church, make the coffee, sweep the floor. doesn't matter, right? I, I do this for Christ, right? And when you have that perspective, you don't get as tired, right? And going back to Mary Martha, right? Mary just doesn't, you know, just sitting at the feet of Christ. And so sometimes as servants, we do a lot of running around, right? But sometimes we just need to sit at the feet of Christ a little bit more and kind of focus our gaze on him. Um, take Andrew. There's a nice story about a, a person who goes into um, a church. And this man used to go into the church. Come on in. And the seats in the front. You know, we should just take the seats in the front and just move into the back. And then you guys all get, you know, bad real estate. Um, there's a story about a man who used to go to a church. And every day he would sit in the back of the church and he'd look at the crucifix as a Catholic church. And the priest saw him many, many times, and he just sat there. And then after a while, the priest was kind of curious, right? So he went up to him, and he said, you know, you, do you want to talk, or is there anything going on? You know, I always see you back here. And he goes, no, when everything's, everything's fine. He goes, really? I mean, you just come in here, and you sit all the time. And, you know, what, is there a problem? What are you praying for? Maybe I can pray with you. He's like, no. He's like, I, I just come in. I look at him, and he looks at me, and we're both happy. I just love that. Right? So I just come in and we just, we just look at each other. I just look at my dad. Right? And we, you know, we see this even in our children, right? How our kids like to play next to us. They want to see us. They want us there. They want us around. They, necessarily, they don't want to necessarily play with us, right? Not all the time. But they just want us present. They can look and see us there. So this gaze is very, very important, especially as a servant, right? Because it's very easy to get distracted with all the things, right? The services and the schedules and the stuff and then the problems with people and somebody doing this and Abuna did that and the Min Khidma did this and everyone's just always turmoil in the service, right? And it's much easier, right, when you're, when you're deep, you know? Uh, Abuna Loa Sidros in, uh, in LA, he's kind of a, a legend, but, you know, he used to just talk about depth and he would say, you know, when there's a storm, you know, and the boats are flopping around and, you know, and they're about to crash. He's like, you know, the fish don't know there's a storm, right? You know, they're 100 feet down and they have no idea what's happening on the surface, right? To them, it's just swimming, you know, even though the, there's a tidal wave up above, right? But, um, and the deeper you go, the less of the storm you feel, right? And that's why you hear about these, these guys who were imprisoned in Egypt and, you know, the, the bishops and the priests and the monks that were in prison, and they're just like happy as clams, right? There's so much depth there that all this stuff happens up here on the surface and just doesn't affect you, right? And I was talking with my, my cousins this morning. We were just looking at, like, what happened during COVID, right, and how people got so affected uh, in many, many very destructive ways, right, and so scared. Anyway, this is one of my favorite quotes about the Eucharist. St. Cyril of Alexandria says, Just by melting two candles... Just as by melting two candles together, you get one piece of wax. So I think one who receives the flesh and blood of Jesus is fused together with him by this communion. And the soul finds that he is in Christ and Christ is in him. And I just love this image, right? I mean, you imagine taking like two candles, you know, like a nice one that's you know, like lavender or something, some nice scented one. And then you melt it with some other one that doesn't have a nice scent. And you, you melt them in, you know, into liquid and then you pour them into one mold and you make one candle. You can't tell where one starts and one ends. They're just fused together, right? And then when you burn the candle, what comes out? It's the aroma of Christ himself, right? So this is, this is what the Eucharist is. It, it, by, it puts us in him and, and he in us. There's a quote from Abuna Metta. I'll just read the first part. So God created man in his own image so that man should bear witness in himself to God's self. So when we think about the world, the world can't see God. Um, and so, but they can see us. And so ultimately we are called to be that image of him, right? Um, St. Athanasius has this beautiful uh, analogy. I can't remember if it's in my slides or not, so I'll just say it. It might come up later. Um, and you see how much I butchered it. But he says, basically, the way the sun is to the moon is the way God is to the Christian. Right? So the sun is always the source of light and the source of heat and the source of power. And the moon is just like a dead rock, right? It's just, it's just dust. 
right? and it reflects the light of the sun. So at night, I can't see the sun, right? The sun's behind me, you know, but I can see the moon. And so I know there's a sun because I can see the moon. Right? And so the Christian is like that, right? In the world, the darkness of this world, people don't see God, but they can see us, the moon, the dust that reflects the light of God, right? And we're the only light they have. We have to be that light, you know, and at night on the water, it's beautiful to see the moon. Um, and so we bear witness to God in ourselves, and that's our calling to bear witness to him. And what is God? God is love. Right? And so that ultimately has to be the message we take into the world. This is St. Therese of Lisieux. She's Catholic, but she's cool. He does not come down. <laughs> I can't believe I said but. He does not come down from heaven each day to stay in the gold chalice. He comes down to find another heaven. He cherishes infinitely more than the first. The heaven of our souls, made in his image, living temples of the most blessed trinity. I love this expression. He comes down to find another heaven he cherishes infinitely more than the first. Right? God lives in heaven. He wants us to be that heaven that he comes down into. So one of the ways we do this as we become a Monday through Saturday Christian is to give everyone you see the same love and forgiveness you just received. So I think that's number three on my points. And I want to read you this, you know, um, this, this, I guess, poem that's comprised of several verses. It says, learn to listen to me, even while you are listening to other people. As they open their souls to your scrutiny, you are on holy ground. You need the help of my spirit to respond appropriately. So as you're listening to other people, remember that you need my help to respond to them appropriately. Ask him, God, to think through you, live through you, love through you. My own being is alive within you in the person of the Holy Spirit. If you respond to others' needs through your unaided thought processes, you offer them dry crumbs. When the Spirit empowers your listening and speaking, however, my streams of living water flow through you to other people. Be a channel of my love, my joy, and my peace by listening to me as you listen to others. So even in the act of being there for a friend, listening to their story, whatever. You have to be very aware that if you're going to offer your own wisdom, you're offering dry crumbs. And that that isn't what God's calling us to do. So when, we, when we're out there being light to people, don't ever think you're the light. Right? It's kind of like, you know, this moon and sun analogy that we just talked about, right? The moon, if the moon thinks, man... I'm pretty amazing, you know, here I am lighting up this night, you know, moon's delusional, right? Like, you know, you know, you're just a dead rock, right? You're just dust. You're not, you don't have any light of your own to offer. And we're the same way, right? In fact, one of the things I, I always make this comment, one of the things I love is, you know, we have these little things in the church that are just wonderful. Like when a speaker ends, we always say what? The speaker says, and glory be to God forever, right? And in the secular world, what do we do when a speaker ends? We clap, right? So when you clap, you're clapping for me. Okay? But the speaker who's, who's giving a talk or a sermon or whatever is very aware and says, no, no, and glory be to God. Right? If there's anything you liked, I'm a moon. I reflect light. There's nothing that I'm offering that isn't, that's mine. I have nothing to give of mine. There's a, a, a funny, a nice story. I can't remember if I told you this or not. There were, you guys watched 60 Minutes, kind of an old, old magazine show. In 60 Minutes, they interviewed one of the monks at Mount Athos. They, they wanted to go, go back to Mount Athos. So you can find this on YouTube, actually. It's pretty nice. So they had gone 20 years earlier. I don't know if you guys know Mount Athos is this peninsula off the coast of Greece, and it's got lots of monasteries, very holy place. And it's very hard to get into. You've got to get a visa and stuff like that. So they decided to go to Mount Athos after 20 years, and, and they applied for a visa. It took them two years before Mount Athos agreed to give him an interview, right? So I forgot his name, but the guy was the famous guy at 60 Minutes was interviewing this, the head of the monastery, this, this Greek guy, right? And 
you know, he starts the interview and, you know, niceties, right? Thank you very much for inviting me out and letting our camera crew be here. He's like, oh, sure, no problem, blah, 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 right? And then the, the interviewer says, you know, uh, I just want to thank you. I know we're very disruptive and, um, you know, we're, we're disturbing, you know, the, the monastery and, and we're disrupting your prayers. And, and then when he said, we're disrupting your prayers, the monk laughed, just kind of chuckled. And the monk goes, oh, no problem, no problem. And then the, 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 the interviewer guy goes, uh, why'd you laugh? And he goes, no, no, it's nothing. It's fine. You're not disturbing us. That's okay. He goes, no, you laughed when I said, You're dis I'm disturbing your prayers. He goes, yeah. And he goes, well, uh, am I disturbing your prayers? He goes, no. And the guy goes, well, I mean, are you praying right now? And he goes, of course I am. I just love that answer. Right? So he's doing this interview with this guy on 60 Minutes, and the guy asks a question. He prays. He answers. He prays. The guy asks another question. He prays. He answers. Right? So he was very aware of what this is saying here. Right? You need the help of my spirit to respond appropriately. So even as I'm talking, giving a secular interview, I'm not giving spiritual advice. I'm not helping someone. He's a constant dialogue. Right? So when we say you give everyone the same love, you have to be careful that I'm giving them his love, not my love, his spirit, not my spirit, his heart, not my heart. And so be very keenly aware when you're talking to a kid or talking to a friend or talking to whomever um, that you're, there's this constant dialogue happening, right? All the time, right? I'm giving a Sunday school lesson. You know, we're always taught to pray before, during, and after, especially the during part, right? Especially when you get a question from like Musiba over here. Oh, okay, here's the quote from St. Athanasius. By analogy, God is to the Christians as the sun is to the moon, and as the sun is the exclusive source of light, so God is the sole source of glory. As the moon reflects light, so believers reflect God's glory. So that's the, the good quote. But So this is the liturgy starts when we leave church. And I kind of want us to, to anchor on that a little bit. The liturgy starts when we leave, leave church. It's not like I did my duty, I did my thing, I put in my time, I'm good. No, 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 now it's, now it's on. Right now I take this light and my goal is to be light and love everywhere I go. You all know this quote, I don't know if you know it, but it's my favorite quote. There would, no be, there would be no need for sermons, like the one I'm giving now, <laughs> if our lives were shining. There would be no need for words if we bore witness with our deeds. There would be no more pagans if we were true Christians. Right? And every time, you know, I, I, you get in this shouting match and people are like, you have to tell people what's right and you have to tell people what's wrong and you have to tell them. The, do you? And that's not what he says. He said something different. He said, you know, shine with your actions. Shine with your deeds. It's not about yelling verses at people and telling them who's right and who's wrong. It's about being, you know, being that, that, that love. Right? And, and so many of us have experienced this, right? Where, where people from work come up to us and they trust us and they'll share deep secrets with us because they just feel something different about us. You know, in the early church, um, there's this, you know, f funny stories, but when someone would see someone else that's smiling, they would say, did you meet a Christian today? And that's how you would greet somebody who you saw smiling, right? And I would be so wonderful if we ever got back to that state again, right? Where people would say, you know, because right now you look in America, Canada, wherever, Christians don't have the best name, right? When, we're, when you tell someone I'm a Christian, they're, they're not like, oh, that's great. You really love me. You're so gracious and forgiving. That's not what people say. They say, oh, you must be a bigot. You must be a racist. You're full of hate, huh? You're going to judge me, aren't you? And they're kind of right. That's what we do. We have to work on that. Right? We have to be that old Christian, the, you know, the, the people we came from, where people would say, I'm smiling. Did you see a Christian today? Did you bring light to someone's life? Did you take a little bit of a burden off of them and put it on yourself? Did you give him to give the person God's words and not your own? Give everyone the same love you just received. This is what St. Augustine says. A Christian is a mind through which Christ thinks a heart through which Christ loves, a voice through which Christ speaks, and a hand through which Christ helps. We're the hands and eyes and ears of God on earth, right? And so sometimes we get into this lovely habit of like, you know, someone needs help, and you go, right? I'll pray for you. God be with you. 
All right, well, I, I don't, you know, right now, I need you to stay up with me and listen and talk. I need you to help me. I need you to give me something, right? And, and telling them, you know, God give you. Well, God sent me to you, right? And so God did give you, and, and he gave you me, and I'm it, right? So think about that as we take the Eucharist and say, you know, the, even the concept of the Eucharist, right? I mean, the, the way God, the way Christ, you know, brought this all together, right? He, he used food, you know, and food is one of these things that we, we do a lot of in the church. We feast and we fast and we feast and we fast. Food is very integral to the, to the ethos and the, or, uh, the, uh, the, the rituals of the church. And because food is one of those things that just, it's in you. Right, and so when I take the body of, of Christ, it, it literally penetrates every cell in my body at some level. Right, it just it it gets absorbed by the body. Right, so I would hope that as we take the Eucharist, we say this prayer and we say, "I want to get out of the way of you." You know, I want there to be less me and more you. Right, I want people to see you when they see me. You know, when uh, I lived in New Jersey, I was born in New Jersey. Uh, when Abu Shwey Kamil came to New Jersey. Uh, my uncle was the, the priest at New Jersey at the time, so he visited us a lot and stuff like that. And my uncle was telling me, he said, all the, all the people in the houses said the same thing when Abu Nubshoi Kamil came to visit. They would say, we didn't know who Jesus was until we saw you, until we met you. And then all the stories made sense. We didn't know who Jesus was until we met you. It's like, wow. You know, that's wonderful. have to give is love um no, sorry <laughs> yeah like what you're saying now is really practical and it's really starting to make sense and even when you said i want to read what my dad is saying because i want to go to my dad for advice and i want to be more like him that's more layman's terms that's more applicable that's more like it's really starting to make sense and when the man of God was in Starbucks and he left two Starbucks cards and six months later he said that it was just because he's like I only have love to give it's the only thing I can return and so full circle and it really is making more sense for me yeah that was Abbot uh, Trifont yeah, he's really amazing um, so one of God's characteristics is that he's a creator and God creates, he builds up, he transforms, he develops from less to more, he moves from darkness to light, he purifies and refines, he takes evil and turns it into good. And this is God creating. And so the question is, how can I, I'm supposed to be the image and likeness of God, how do I manifest these characteristics in my life? Who do I build up? Who do I create? And we talked yesterday about being a parent and sharing the process of creation as being, as being part of parenting. But the question is, how and whom do I create and build? Anyone seen this statue before? It's a beautiful statue. You have to look at it carefully. It's a beggar outside the church. See his hand? So it's got a nail in it. And so the beggars and the poor and the widows and the orphans and everyone else who, who needs. These are the people I can build up. These are the people I, when I say manifest love to, who do I manifest love to? Well, there it is. And so then who are these poor and needy people? Well, clearly they're in downtown Toronto, right? They're homeless and they're in the shelters and they're in all these places. And the question we always have to ask is, is it just the poor and needy? And the answer is absolutely not. Right, um, you know when I when I listen to the the litany of the sick, um, you know we say you know those who are in dungeons and those who are in distress and those who are in, imprisoned, you know, and I think to myself, is anyone in a dungeon anymore? Like, do we still have dungeons? Um, and then I think, yeah, no, there's lots of people in dungeons, a lot of people in dungeons, right? The dungeons of their mind, people imprisoned by addiction, people enslaved to habits. And, People who are trapped in their own head. People who are broken. People who are sad. And are those people hard to find? No, just look around this room. Real easy. Right? 
everyone in this room, and as you know, Abuna can testify, right? As you start to going into people's houses, you realize everyone has issues, everyone has brokenness, everyone has their own cross and their own pain. And who else to carry those burdens with than the rest of us? We all carry them together. So the poor and needy, sure, they're in the shelters for sure, and they're in Egypt and in these places full of poverty, but they're everywhere. Everyone needs someone, right? And how wonderful of a therapeutic community we would be if we all saw that in each other, and instead of judging the other person for, I can't believe you did that, or even worse, just gossiping about them and not confirming the story in the first place, which is our you know, first mode of operation, instead of us, you know, you're that therapeutic person who's, who's going to be there to support your brother and sister in Christ, right? So when we say be this Monday through Saturday Christian, you know, like, well, how do I serve? How do you serve? Everyone's in need, you know? Everyone needs. And there's lots of people, and the priests are running around like crazy, you know? And, and unfortunately, we kind of have this mindset that only Abuna can help people. That's not true, right? We can all help each other. We can all alleviate the burden of one another. This is St. John of Kronstadt, he says, and this is just, you know, giving us perspective. God is long-suffering and merciful to you. This you experience many times every day. Be long-suffering and merciful to your brethren. It's real simple, isn't it? I was uh, talking to this, uh, I was talking to this, uh, this woman who hates her husband, and uh, she's just pissed at him. They're better now. Um, and... She was just like, I can't believe, you know, I can't believe he did this again. Like, what an idiot. You know, and she used stronger words than that. And, um, I, and I was like, well, maybe this, maybe that. And she's like, you know, you know I, I don't know why you're giving him so much slack. I don't know why you're making so many excuses. I don't know why you're giving him so many chances. And I just said, because God gave me a lot of chances. And God gave me a lot of slack. So that's why I'm giving him a lot of slack. It's real simple for me. And then, of course, she's like, okay, fine, if you say it like that. And she gave up, right? But that's what this quote is, right? Be long-suffering and merciful because God has been long-suffering and merciful with you. And we're really good at accepting God's long-suffering and mercifulness, but we're really bad at giving it to other people. You know, I mean, someone burns us once, ah, you're on the short list. Someone burns us twice, I'm done with you. And like, how many times have you burned God? How many dozens and thousands of times have you burned God? Right? And God just is sitting there like the sun. Doesn't matter what you do, no matter what you say to him, he's just back and he's going to warm you. Well, sometimes warm you um, the next day. <laughs> Sorry, I just keep making these Canada jokes. I have a caramel macchiato. Yes? This might be a silly question. And it's for me. I just, could you explain long-suffering? Like is, is uh, patience. It's patience. That's just another word for patience. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, um, you suffer long with someone, right? I mean, kind of like we do with kids. We long suffer with them, right? They pee on themselves, they pee on themselves, they pee on themselves, and we just kind of, we're patient with them while suffering. Yeah, I mean. And then St. Isaac the Syrian one of my favorites, he, he says, spread your cloak over those who fall into sin, each and every one, and shield them. And you just think about how this transcends in the world we see today. You know, like now, when someone messes up, you put, excuse me, you put them on blast, everyone tells everybody, even if it's not confirmed. And you hear about these, you know, these horrible things, I don't want to get too, well, I'll stop. Um, but we do the opposite, right? We don't cover people. We don't hide their sins, right? I mean, you think of the story of St. Macarius. You know, St. Macarius is awesome. Um, and, you know, the, these monks said, you know, a monk, one of the monks has a woman he sleeps with in his cell, which is just not a good look for a monk, right? And St. Macarius is like, well, maybe you misunderstood. Maybe he's helping her out. Maybe they're talking about problems, whatever, right? So then one time the monks come up to St. Macarius and they say, she's in there now. Let's go get him. Right? So St. Macarius is fine. Right? He walks over. He knocks on the door. Abuna such and such. This is Macarius. 
he hears a bunch of shuffling. Okay, Sabuna, just one second, just getting ready, right? He hears all this moving inside, you know. He opens the door, the monk lets him in, and it's not a very big cell, obviously, it's tiny, right? And St. Macarius takes one quick glance and figures out she can only be hiding there, right? So what does he do? You all know how this story ends, right? It's a basket. So he goes and he sits on top of the basket, she's underneath, and he says, search. See, she's not here. Everyone in the room knows exactly what just happened. He covered the sins of someone else, right? Now, let me ask you, is St. Macarius enabling monks to sleep with women? Is he promoting that? Is he pro that? Because he didn't speak up against it, then he should therefore, you know, he's part of the problem. What's the word? Silence is complicit. All the things we say today that are not Christian. Right? There's St. Macarius, that's our guy. And that's how he acted. Right? I wish we did the same thing. Cover the sins of others. Instead, we just tell everybody about them. And we make them worse than the, the reality. So what happens at the liturgy? That's a liturgy. <laughs> Remember what I told you guys yesterday about the icons of the liturgy? So what do you see in this icon? Where are you in this icon? Look carefully. You're at the table. Right? You're at the end of the table. So in no icon, Coptic or Orthodox icon, you never see the end of the table. It always ends at you. We become a part of Christ, and then, of course, if I'm a part of Christ and you're a part of Christ, then we become a part of each other, right? So the Eucharist not only unites me with God, but it unites me with me and you in, in a mystical, Eucharistic way that isn't just like, hey, we're all Coptic, hey, we're all Egyptian, hey, we all live in the greater Toronto area, hey, we all live around SMSV, whatever. No, 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 we're part of each other. Right? And you can't imagine that a part of the body would hurt another part of the body. And I know we mentioned this yesterday, but when that happens, we call that cancer. Right? When the body attacks itself, it's a very dangerous thing. Right? And so here we are as a community, and every once in a while you'll see the community attack the community. People within the body will attack one another. And it's crazy. Or one time, um, I was with some friends, and uh, we were talking about a teenager at our church who was just like, you know, really messing up um, and, you know, messing up and became public and all that stuff. And one of them said, um, he said, I'm glad it's not my kid. And I just looked at him, I go, what did you just say? Like, How could you? Say, I didn't, you know, I thought, I judged him. How could you say that? How could you not feel what this dad is feeling? How could you be so cold to think, well, it's not me, it's them. Are you gonna other and us and them, someone in the body of Christ, in your own body? You know, I couldn't believe it. And, and I said this example yesterday, right? It's kind of like when the, you know, the, the pancreas gets cancer and then the brain thinks to itself, oh, glad I didn't get cancer. I'm glad it's the pancreas, not me. Well, you're all connected, stupid, right? So we all die. We're a body, right? And if something affects one part of the body, there's no way it doesn't affect me. And there's no way I can sleep at night seeing another part of the body hurting and me just sitting back and going, yeah, well, I got my house. At least it's not raining in my house. At least it's not, my kids aren't on drugs. Nothing makes one like Christ as taking care of others. Uh, I'll skip that. No one can feel hatred towards one whom you praise for. Uh, okay, I'll say this. It's kind of inappropriate, but I'll say it anyway. Um, so to me, the Eucharist is a lot like a watering hole. So this is a watering hole in Africa, right? You all know the watering hole. You all watch National Geographic, right, in those shows where they show the cheetah catching the gazelle and all that stuff, right? And everyone's like so sorry for the gazelle. I'm like, please don't catch the gazelle. No, the gazelle's going to die, right? Um, so this is the watering hole, right? And as you all know, in the summer in Africa, the watering hole gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So there's more danger at the watering hole. Why? Because you see all the prey that's at the watering hole? Well, prey brings predators, okay? So 
you just see this calm watering hole, right? But what you don't see on the outskirts are like these lions like hanging out, right? And they're waiting for like that weak gazelle, like the one that's limping a little bit because that's the one they're going to chase and kill, right? So all these animals, and then there's like a crocodile in there that's just about to, you know, pounce out, grab a thing, and then do a death spiral, right? You know, that's what happens in these things, okay? This isn't new to people, right? You know, all seen these shows, okay? So here's the thing about the watering hole. Watering hole is two things. It's life. You've got to come to the watering hole. And it's death. <laughs> you could die at the watering hole, right? So the trick to the watering hole is you got to go to the watering hole, drink, and just get out of there as quickly as you can because there's predators at the watering hole, okay? I'll just stop there, but I, the point I want to make is uh, go to church. We take Christ. And then we go away and get out of there, right? The longer you stay, <laughs> the more it hurts. Um, but my point, sometimes we come to the watering hole. We come to the well, the fountain of life. And we have, you know, make a big picnic around the fountain, right, around the well. We bring, you know, sandwiches, and macarona and everything. And we don't even drink. We just come. And we have to be very careful that we're not just coming to the well, and not drinking, or just showing up, hanging out, meeting our friends, chatting, and then leaving. If you're going to come all the way here, drink something, right? Take him in. I love this quote. Um, so coming back to how do we see the weak and those who are hurting, and how do we not judge them? I love this quote. He says, Unless we see, unless we look at a person and see the beauty there is in this person, we can contribute nothing to him. So I'll just stop us right there. Unless you look at a person and you see beauty in that person, you can contribute nothing. So I'd like you all to just sit on that sentence for a sec. So when you see another person and you don't see beauty in them, just walk away. Don't say another word. Because if all you see is ugly, nothing good comes out of this conversation. So you want to help someone and you want to show them God and you want to bring them back to church and you want to, if you don't see them as beautiful, it's no point. He continues, one does not help a person by discerning what is wrong, what is ugly and what is distorted. Which if you think about most of our discussions, let me tell you what's wrong, what's ugly and what's distorted in you. This is bad, this is bad, this is wrong, this is ugly. Don't, don't, don't. And then the church becomes a place of don'ts, lists and lists of don'ts. But he says, Christ looked at everyone he met, at the prostitute, at the thief, and saw the beauty hidden there. Perhaps it was distorted beauty, perhaps damaged, but it was beauty nonetheless. And what he did was to call out this beauty. So as we serve our youth and we serve our friends and we serve the people at work and we see, serve the world and our communities, seeing the beauty in people is the key and calling out that beauty is, is what motivates people towards, towards God, right? We see this even in the story of the, the Samaritan woman, right? The story of the Samaritan woman. Christ doesn't tell her how bad she is. He starts with, you know what, you've spoken truthfully. And she's like, yeah, I did speak truthfully. I am an honest person. You saw something good in me. He picked out like the one good thing. And he said, you've spoken truthfully. And she liked that. And it resonated. Um, okay. So now I want to get to the, my final point. So this is the spirit of the Eucharist. This is the spirit of being a Monday and Saturday, through Saturday Christian. And then the question is, what stifles this spirit in us? The spirit of... Christ being light in us that we then show to the world. So these are the four points I just talked about. Absorb Christ and then become light for those who are in the world. Give everyone the same love and forgiveness you just received. The liturgy starts when we leave church. You have just come and drink, dr drink, drunk from the fountain of life. Be a fountain of hope and love for all those you meet this week. Right? And so this is ultimately what the Eucharist is. So when I leave this place, hey guys, you got rid of the, the headband. Like the best. I want to play with you guys. All right. Um, so this is this is what the Eucharist is supposed to be. 
Okay, do we all agree? Does this sound like a sound message to you, what I said today? And I'd like to ask you, how many times have you heard things like, the liturgy starts when we leave church in your life? So I'm 53, and I can tell you I haven't heard it much. So what stifles the spirit in us? It's a matter of emphasis. So as servants, sometimes we emphasize the wrong things. This should be the emphasis of the Eucharist and the message of the Eucharist. Instead, what often is emphasized is don't spit for nine hours. Don't swim for nine hours. Don't chew gum for nine hours. Don't throw up for nine hours. Don't walk barefoot in case you get a small cut for nine hours. Don't brush your teeth for nine hours. And those are way more important than the stupid stuff I just talked about for the last 45 minutes. Right now, I'm 53. I've heard those things a thousand times in my 53 years. And that's all anybody's talking about. Right? Now, we can debate and discuss whether nine hours and not spitting for nine hours is the law of God. I'm going to go ahead and say it, it isn't. And I'll be excommunicated for that, I'm sure. But um, let's focus on what's important. Right? When this is the stuff that gets emphasized and talked about and thought about, and you know, you're leaving church and you're telling your kid, you know, Okay, be careful. Don't spit. Versus, you have the body of Christ. Are you going to go to your friends and show them love? Are you going to be merciful? And when your you know, kid's playing on Tuesday and they get in a fight with their sister and they say, I don't want to forgive her. I don't, I'm, remember God forgave you on Sunday. Remember God, how much God loved you on Sunday? Remember how God gave himself for you on Sunday? I want you to do the same thing for your sister today. So now the link is what the emphasis is. I want to be like that guy. I want to be with him, and I want to be him for others in the world, all others in the world, not just my people on Sunday. Where does this come from? That guy. Maybe that guy. So that's where some of these things come from. And we have to be careful as a, as a church, right? When you're with another culture for 1,500 years, some of that other culture probably is in your culture. They've all mixed. Um, so depth is not Phariseeism. The law itself is good, but the trap is this. If we take obeying the law as a condition for salvation, we are saying salvation comes not from God's freely given love, but from my own deeds. The two modes of, are directly opposed to one another. So one of the, f the fearful things is by saying, I did these things so therefore, I deserve blessing. I deserve salvation. I deserve God to be in my life. I fasted. I went to church. I did all the hard things. I didn't live a bad life. I, 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 I. The problem with that is if I asked you who saved you, what's the answer? I saved me. I did it, didn't I? I did all the hard things. I went to all the ceremonies. I did all the stuff I'm supposed to do. I did this. And once you start saying that I did this, that really gives me free reign to what? Judge everybody else, right? Because you didn't do what I did. You don't come as much as I do. You don't live as good of a life as I do. You sin and I don't, right? And so we have to be very careful that we keep the perspective. This is God's gift to us. And the things we do in church, Eucharist, confession, communion, all the practices we have is just my way of tapping into him. He's doing all the work. Pope Shenouda had this, this wonderful expression. He said, he said, uh, he was talking about works and faith, you know, in, in St. James. And he says, you know, God already cooked the meal, right? He, he made, there's a big pot and it, all the food is done. It's on the stove. It's hot. It's ready. The bowls are out. And when we... Um, participate in the communion and the confession and all of these things. All we do is we take and we're just serving ourselves from the work that's already been done. This is just how we partake in this pot, but the pot's already been made. You didn't do any of that. That was God's work on the cross. So also don't get confused that somehow I'm earning God, I'm earning heaven by doing all of these things and I do them better than the next guy. And so therefore I'm a better person than this other person. Now this is just my way of participating with him and feeling his love in my life. 
Um, we'll stop there. I don't want to get into the Pharisees. <laughs> Bad joke. Just thought of it. Anyone have any questions or comments, criticisms, complaints? Yes, sir. Okay. So my question is a two-part question. Uh, one is, so when one finds themselves doing the things that they think they're supposed to be doing, how do they attribute that to God and not kind of look at that thing as like the work that they've done? Because like I feel like as a Christian, you're supposed to grow like and partake of the sacraments and like show love when you can and serve when you can. But then there's like that left-hand warfare that comes like right when that happens. So like how does one like prepare for that and like when do you know when you're doing it wrong okay that's a good question so you know saint augustine has a, a wonderful quote he says and it's similar to, to answering your question he says um don't ever do anything don't ever do any good deeds so that people will see you but don't ever not do anything good because people will see you right so what you have to be very careful of is in your own motivation in your own head right why am I doing this, right? And if I'm doing a good thing and I'm doing it for my Lord, I don't care who sees it. I don't care if no one sees it. I don't care if everyone sees it. It doesn't matter. But if I'm doing it so that people can see me, then we have a problem, right? Because now my motivation isn't God. It's others. It's the glory of the world, right? As far as being humbled, I wouldn't worry too much God has a way of doing that for you, right? So trust me, you'll be broken soon enough, right? And as soon as we kind of get ahead of ourselves just a little bit, and we start kind of, you know, I'm the, I'm the man, I'm the this, all of a sudden the, the trial comes that, we, you know, we didn't see coming out of left field, and then bam. And then you come face to face with your brokenness, right? And it happens to all of us in multiple ways. And when you do, your choices are to... Um, you know, you, you, you retract a little and you say, all right, maybe I'm not as amazing as I thought I was. You know, um, you know the, in the Bustan Rahman, the, the Paradise of the Fathers, there's a great quote that says, when you see your brother sinning a great sin, you say him tomorrow, him today, me tomorrow. Right? So I don't judge, no monk who knows anything judges anybody, right? They see this guy mess up, they go, him today, me tomorrow. I don't know, right? Nobody's above any sin, right? Um, and so God sends us these things, and sins have a very, you know, good way of humbling us, right? And, and then you come up against your weakness. Now, what unfortunately happens sometimes, right, that weakness and that brokenness and that sense of I'm really not as good as I thought, that hurts, okay? So I can choose now to dig deeper, repent, figure out what's going on in my life that's causing me to have this big ego or the bad option, I'm going to fake it. You know, I'm just going to kind of do my thing, but I'm going to make sure no one knows and I'm going to, I'll learn more hymns and I'll do more things, right? And activity will be my way of covering up the work that I don't want to do, right? Because there's work down here that I need to do and I don't want to do it. So I'll learn the next thing and I'll do the next meeting, and I'll do the next service, and I'll do la, 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 all these things, which are great things, but why are you doing them? Well, because I don't really want to do the main work, right? And Christ's message is very clear, right? You know, deny yourself, carry your cross, and follow me. So it's much easier to start doing these things, right? And, you know, in our Christianity, we have what's called a micro-morality, right? Our morality is me. I focus on me. And in the world, what we see now is a lot of macro morality, which is I focus on other people's ca causes, right? I want to end racism. I want to end homophobia. I want to end bigotry. I want to end, you know, save the whales, save the seals, save the dolphins, you know, not have plastic anything, right? Causes, right? Which are fine. You, if you want to be part of a cause, be part of a cause. But don't let that cause replace my work, right? Because all of a sudden, I don't, I can, I can, it's much easier to get distracted saving everybody else, making sure all the bad people out there are not bad and, and neglect the work that has to happen with me. In fact, it's easier to do that. Yes. 
continue with his question. Uh, as a servant or as a mom, uh, if I do something just because of God, not because of anyone, but is it good idea to show it to my kids or to my people who I'm, whom I am serving to give them like a model, like how son of God or daughter of God, how she acts in special situations? Um, we talked a little bit about this yesterday at the retreat. Um, personally, I'm not a big fan of that. Now, there's, there's several things that can happen, right? You know, when, when a servant says, I have to come early so that my kids in Sunday school can see me come early, or the parent says, I come to church for my kids, I don't think that's a good motivation. And I'll tell you why. It's because I think everybody can tell that you're being fake, if it's fake. If you're doing it for God, then do it. But if it's just to be fake, you know, growing up, I mean, if you all think about all the people I know growing up in church as I grew up, and some of them were servants, I knew who the fake ones were, and I knew who the ones who really loved me were. And I knew the ones who just wanted to be in the, in the front line, tend the show, and talked about, about themselves. And I can tell who is not real. That, that not real thing is, I think, very destructive to the youth, right? Because as a servant, I can get carried away with my appearance. And now I'm so focused on this appearance that now I've neglected, neglected my own work for a very long time. And although I don't see it, everyone else sees it, right? And everyone else knows, oh, that smile is fake and you don't really love the person and you're just doing this because everybody, and everyone knows, except for the person themselves. They think, oh, I'm amazing, right? So I would say, you know, I, I'm of, of the mindset if, if, if it, your heart isn't in it, then you have to stop and really evaluate, right? Instead of, I should do this and I should just continue and I should be, you know, like that. I mean, I'll tell you this is personal, but even, you know, after I became an Archie, you know, five or six years ago, I said to myself, I'm never going to, I don't want to go to a liturgy because I have to go to a liturgy because I enjoy liturgy and I didn't want this to be a job where I, I, I have to go on the Archie, right? So um, I don't want that to influence me. So I, I don't go if I don't feel like going, right? Or, you know, if I don't feel forced to go. So I, I would say the, one of the things the youth really don't like is appearances. So more real and less, you know, showing. Just be in your, in your own life the real way. Okay, but if I'm being in my own life, but as a mom, how can I uh, teach my kids by, like, sometimes I need to show them something that, to reflect my relation with God, so they learn by uh, watching. seeing, watching, sure, sure. not by I just agree. Uh, hearing. No, no, I agree a thousand percent. In fact, that's much better than by talking just doing and this is actually what we talked about yesterday at the retreat like all day was you know being that person is really far more instructive to the kids than doing than than talking but the other thing I'll I'll, I'll say is um, you have to ask you have to be very careful as to what it means by doing because you know some 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 people say well look I come to church and I go to this and I go to this I go to this but then I heard the way you talk to the waiter at the restaurant is very rude. And the way you treat the maid is very rude. And the way you treat people is terrible. And I saw you talking about uncle such and such and tante such and such and gossiping about your own sister. And so, you know, God is love, right? Not attending church. So we have to be very careful that what we're showing them isn't just see how I go, but see how I am. And they notice those things. Yeah. Yes, sir. Is there something to say for um, doing things out of a responsibility or it, like you said, like uh, sometimes we do go to church, we don't feel it, but we do it because we know it's right. But I think like you want to be real about it too. Like I, I, don't, I don't fake it to my kids, but we should go to church. Like we need communion, but I'm not feeling it today kind of thing. Sure. No, no, absolutely. Right. And, and some of the fathers teach us that. You know, one of the, the best times to pray is the time when you don't feel like praying, right? Because that's when, you know, God's grace is opened upon you, right? And so many times I've 
not wanted to do something and went kicking and screaming and it was the best experience of my life. So um, that's, a, that's an aspect of discipline, right? And that discipline, that spiritual discipline is, is very important, right? There's a, there's a discipline to the spiritual life. Um, what, I, what you don't want to happen is to allow the discipline to be God, right? So I worship the discipline. I am focused on the discipline. My objective is the discipline. It's like, no, no, my objective is still God. I'm going to use the discipline to get to him. And sometimes I'm not feeling the God thing, so I'm going to rely on the discipline because it's going to help me get there, right? But that's not my, you know, my objective isn't to go to the gym. My objective is to be healthy, right? And so focus, you know, that, that or lose weight or to whatever my goal is, right? My, my goal isn't, isn't walking into the gym, especially if I walk into the gym and I just stand there, you know. And, but I made it to the gym, you know, get on a treadmill or something. You know. I'm at Haga. You had two parts to your question, and we got to part one. And we got part three. Um, so kind of relating what you're saying about discipline, uh, but to, like, service towards others and, like, faking it, I find it hard because, like, sometimes when people come to me with their problems or, like, like I have to go, like, greet someone, like, like, I have to fake it because, I ha like, I have no heart. Like, I can't, like, love this person as I should. <laughs> so, like, how do I, like, like, I hear the saying, like, oh, you should fake it till you make it until you actually love this person. So, like, how do you, like, differentiate that where, like, you're, like, serving someone, um, like, even though you don't feel, like, any ways towards them or you're, like, kind of detached from the situation, like, you're still giving them love even though it's not there. Okay, that's a really good question. Um, we touched a little bit on this again at the retreat yesterday and the day before, but... The, one of the ways that helps me is sometimes, you know, is thinking about who the service is towards, right? I'm not serving that person, right? I serve God. So my fervor, my heart, my lack of sleeping, my staying up late, you know, is I look up at God and, and I say, this is for you. It's not for this guy, right? Or this person. Um, because a lot of times, you know, that person, you're not feeling it. That person doesn't even deserve it, right? That person's a jerk. That person's been mean to you. That person lies. And the idea behind um, service is, is, is I offer what God offered me, which is unconditional love, right? So my service isn't toward the person because at some point I don't want to serve them, right? I mean, even, even in marriage, right? If, if my love is toward the person, well, there's going to be times that person doesn't deserve to be loved. Now what? Right? That person messed up and did something really bad. Why am I still married? Because my, my devotion is to God, not to the person. Right? So there's lots of people I serve that don't deserve it. But you know what? I don't deserve it either. And God gives me. So I give the way he gives me. Did you have a third question or no? You have really good questions. Yes. So, um. So this all sounds very, very full right now. And I'm sure next Sunday won't be my struggle. It's the Sundays after that. Is there kind of um, a practical reminder that I can kind of maybe buy time with on like come Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays of every week, just to kind of, you know, because like, again, the fire would probably be there Mondays and Tuesdays just because, but like, how do you rush and or carry yourself through as the week kind of takes over or as you know real life hits later on and you're just like i'm literally just getting there to get to the next sunday at this point so how would i kind of you know find the strength and the reminder constantly where it's like okay we're halfway through we can do this till we get there and catch on our next dose or whatnot right midweek <laughs> that's actually pretty smart <laughs> I don't know if I have this. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, no, I tell you, it's never. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, okay, I don't have it. Um, there's a, uh, yeah, four hours later. There's a, uh, St. Anthony has this uh, wonderful saying. He says, every day I say to myself, today I will begin. Today I will start. Um, and you have to, um, so there's, there's two pieces to this. There's the reminder piece which, you know, it's easy. You can just play this 
you know, this live stream over and over again, right? But then there's the motivation piece. And I think that the motivation piece is hard because sometimes we can get down on ourselves um, because, you know, we keep messing up, right? And we keep not doing all the things that we're supposed to be doing. Um, and, and I'm trying to guess which one is the one you're referring to. Is it the motivation piece? Is it the down on myself piece? What's the second, the down on myself piece? Yeah. Um, so um, I think one of the, the hard things that we all have as we grow up is we learn about who God is, um, starting with our parents. And our parents are not perfect. And so sometimes we hear conditional statements from our parents, conditional love statements, or things we could perceive to be conditional love statements. You know, I, I want you to do this or else, I want you that or else, two more times and then you're done, things like that. And it's very hard then to, to make that leap to God who isn't conditional, right? Who loves unconditionally all the time. And so it gets very, it, it's very easy to get discouraging. And so I have, you know, lots of quotes, not in this talk, um, not in the other talk either, but just about um, getting up and going back to God over and over and over again. And so what God, what God wants from us isn't a victory. He wants a struggle. He wants us to push and to try. And I heard a, a nice uh, sermon by, uh, by Bunametta, Father Matthew the Poor, and he said, you know, it's like a beggar who puts his hand out and he's constantly begging for money. And after a while, his hand gets tired of going out. So he just puts his hand down. And then as someone walks by, you know, a rich man or whatever, a businessman, he says, hey, can you do me a favor? Could you hold my hand and then put money in it? Because I don't want to hold my hand out. And he says, God is so gracious that he will say, okay, I'll hold your hand and then, so help me put my hand up and then fill it. And that's okay. And so sometimes my prayers are even, you know, I don't want to do this. I want to want to do this. Can you help me want to want to? Because I don't even want to want to at this point. Um, and so I think taking those, that weakness to God and just placing it in front of God and then let him solve it, right? You know, and, and enter into that dialogue with your dad, right? And that begins the relationship. He gets you and you get him. You stare at him and he stares at you. Any other questions or comments? I saw it too. I was going to reach over and do it, but that would have been embarrassing. You're still not married? And you touched, and you touched her hair? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to misquote the entire talk. <laughs> Leave him. I love this. He's your husband. Hey, what can you do? <laughs> Anybody have any questions, comments? Okay. And glory be to God forever. Amen. I don't know what the plan is now. So. so right now we're going to have like a five to ten minute break. There's water and some refreshments in the back. And then we'll reconvene for the second talk.